Welcome to r slash reddit revenge. This is a story of someone getting back at someone with revenge after being wronged. Thank you friends for subscribing to the channel and for so many likes. The first story. Ticket woman suspects me of giving her counterfeit money, so I suspect her right back. The second story. Karen wanted to use my email, but I didn't give her my email. The third story. Co-check attendants refused minimum effort to get me my jacket back. I refused them their tips for the busiest part of the night. And the first story is, rude ticket inspector gets a taste of her own medicine. So I'm on the train heading into the city to attend a lecture. I'm a 21 year old student male, having a pleasant enough morning. It was maybe 20 minutes to nine. I missed my usual quarter past eight train, which is normally crammed full of morning commuters. But not to worry, as class didn't start until nine, and I usually stop by and grab a bacon roll and a cup of tea. But I'd make class with five minutes to spare if I gave up my bacony goodness. Tragedy, I know. I had just recently upgraded my bank account and got a new debit card that allowed me to use the card to pay for my train tickets on the train, which was handy because the machines can be slow, and I've missed a few trains in the past when using my old debit card that only worked on these machines, not the handheld one that she has on her person. So I thought why not use this opportunity to test out the new card. As I said it was the train after the usual busy commute, but the carriage was still at least three-fourths full. The ticket inspector comes by, and she's a middle-aged English woman. I live in Scotland, who I've seen before, and have noticed that she can be very rude and obnoxious, and thinks she's God's gift because she has authority on the train. She starts to check people's tickets, tapping her feet and huffing with impatience at people who have to dig around in their pockets to find their ticket, before she can move on, clearly not pleased that people don't have them at the ready. I'm sitting there with my earphones in, minding my own business with my new debit card at the ready. As she approaches me and asks to see a ticket, I flick out one earphone and tell her what type of ticket I need and where I was going. Around this time we were going through a tunnel, so there was a bit of a reverberation of the sound of wind gushing through the carriage. She asks me to repeat myself because she claims she couldn't hear me, so I repeat my request. Now, I don't know if she had hearing problems or being English she couldn't seem to understand my Scottish accent, which isn't very strong at all, because I had to repeat myself a total of three more times. Each time I was progressively getting louder and louder until I was almost shouting, and I could see other people on the train looking up, clearly curious as to why I was talking so loud, proving that they could hear me just fine. Finally, she understands what I'm trying to ask her, and then says in her most be condescending tone, well, if you maybe took out your other earphone while talking, I might be able to hear you better. I sat for a couple seconds in confusion, absorbing what she just said. It didn't make sense, but all attention was on me and her now, and I could see confusion at her statement registering on other nearby passengers' faces as well. Not one for confrontation, I swiftly apologized and handed her my debit card. She huffed and whipped out her card machine, but it seemed like my morning was only going to get worse because my new card got declined. I have money in my account, but later that day I learned that I had to call and text a number to activate my new card, which I forgot to do. She was visibly irritated when I asked her to try and ring it up again, but no luck. I'm starting to get a bit red in the face, because at least half the train is looking in my direction. Some people were look sympathetic towards me, others just smirked at my misfortune. Luckily I keep 20 pounds behind my phone cover in case of emergencies, so I asked her to bear with me while I take my phone out of my pocket and crack open the case, then present her with the 20 note. Now maybe it was because I was a young male, or maybe it was because the note was behind my phone case, but when I handed it to her, she snatched it off me and then held it up to the light and scrutinized it for literally 15 to 20 seconds to see if it was fake. This is strange because it's never happened before, and I've used many 20 pound notes to pay for a ticket before. I ask her if there's a problem with the note, to which she replies in a loud voice, I'll tell you in a minute, boy. O-S-H, she did not just call me boy. You could cut the tension in the carriage with a knife. All eyes were on this transaction at this point. Finally, she seems to accept my note as legal tender and digs around in her purse for my change. I received a few coins back, a five pound note and a 10 pound note. As she handed me the change, she started to walk away, but I saw my one and only chance at revenge. So I loudly said, hang on a minute. And you can probably guess what happened next. I held those notes up to the light, scrutinizing them so intensely it seemed like I was going to burn a hole right through them. As I did this, the entire carriage erupted in laughter and the old couple closest to me started an applause, which spread throughout the majority of the spectators. The ticket woman's face turned a deep shade of violet she hastily made her way to the next carriage, not even bothering to check the remaining people's tickets. Justice was served, and I felt absolutely amazing, and that was my favorite day ever. The second story is, Bridezilla wants my email address. Bridezilla does not get it. 
Info important to the story. My surname can also be used as an uncommon first name. One of my email addresses is first name surname, at, and I've been using it since 2005. A few days ago, I'm sitting at the table with my fiance addressing wedding invitations when my phone buzzes. I've gotten an email that reads, please mark name one and name two is coming to your wedding. We'll have the chicken and the fish. Cue a very confused 30 seconds of trying to figure out which of our guests has precognition and has RSVP before the invites were even dropped in the mail. Not recognizing the sender's email or the names of either guest, we chalk it up to a wrong email address. Send back, you might want to double check who you sent this to so your RSVP goes to the right place and chuckle at the confusion it caused us, thinking things have been resolved. Until the next day. I get two more RSVPs from two different addresses, and a reply from the original that says, this isn't the email for the wedding of first name and surname? I reply back, no, it is not. I'm perplexed, but at work, I decide to deal with the other emails later. When I get home, I've gotten another RSVP, four in total for those playing along at home as well as an email from someone with the same first name as me, saying that she's gonna need me to give her my email account. Um, uh? I reply to that no, and also why. I get an email back in about 10 minutes. She says that she's got the same first name as me, and is getting married to a guy named Surname. They pick first name Surname as their email account for RSVPs. She didn't realize I made the account, so I can either give my password to her, or I can reset it and she can create a new one, whichever works for me. I reply again that she's gonna need to pick a new account. This is mine. It's my full name. I've had it for a literal decade. It's the email all my family knows, blah blah. More apologetic than needed at all, but I wanted to explain why I wasn't giving it up. I do congratulate her on getting married, and mention that I'm getting married myself as well. Oh, she loses it. I get a nasty, nasty string of emails from her saying that I have no right to use first name surname unless my fiance is named surname that I won't need it after I'm married, so what's wrong with giving it up a little early, that I'm ruining her life and her wedding, that I'm a wide array of gender-based insults and slurs. She hopes that my fiancé cheats on me, because I deserve it, and finally she's giving me one more chance to hand it over before she sues me for theft, and I owe her a lot of money. I was more than a little taken aback, so I didn't reply to any of this. The fiancé did offer up some snarky replies for me to use, but I didn't. A few hours later, the original RSVPer sends me an email saying they double-checked the invitation. My email is definitely the one written on the invite. Ah, now the mystery unravels. She put my email on her wedding invites and sent them out to people without first registering the email address herself. It's printed and in the mail. It's permanent. Oh, what a super stupid decision. I finally reply to her tirade without using any of the snarky comments I'd been given, telling her under no circumstances would I be giving her my email. Legally, she doesn't have a leg to stand on. She's being super rude, but I'm still willing to forward on the RSVPs to her if she'd like me to. I ask how many people she invited, so I can get an idea of how much work I just volunteered for. Privately, not really looking forward to forwarding emails for her, but I'm not a nasty person. And hey, it is her wedding after all. I have personal real-time experience of getting stressed over wedding plans myself. Maybe she's normally a nice person and just at her wit's end over this mistake. She sends back a nasty email full of expletives and name calling again demanding my password or nothing. Well, okay, then nothing it is. I blocked her email and replied to the three RSVPs I hadn't talked to yet with a simple, I'm sorry, you're not invited to my wedding. This has the benefit of being 100% true, albeit deceptive. Today I got another RSVP and they got a nice curt not invited reply as well. I'm hoping she has a very large wedding party. Beyonce offered a few snarky replies to the guests I could make, including claiming I'd gone vegan, and by requesting chicken they'd failed the test, and I never wanted them to contact me again. Confirming but pushing back the date of the wedding a week, or saying that I had decided to marry Fiance's name instead of surname. None of them have responded back yet, but if they do, I'll forward the email chain between me and Bridezilla to them and explain the situation. The last story is... You don't ignore a man with unlimited patience. Okay, let me preface this with two things. One, I'm still a little, just a little intoxicated from the time these events took place. And two, I have the utmost respect for tipping, tippers, servers, bartenders, etc. Having worked in the food industry myself. So let me begin. Tonight on my reading break back around my home city, I attended a split birthday event of two of my friends at a downtown bar. Good times are being had, all that stuff. Everything was great until one point. See, I had left my jacket with coat check, but at some point I had lost my coat check ticket by accident. For a normal drunk, this certainly would be disastrous, but I had my wits about me, and due to planning, this couldn't be that big a problem. See, I knew exactly where my jacket was in the coat check area. I knew my coat check number, I knew exactly what was in each pocket of the jacket. 
Heck, I even had a photo ID in one of the pockets. Easy enough to get me my jacket back, right? Nah. After waiting in line, I explained my predicament to the attendants at the coat check in detail, which included pointing to my jacket and telling them exactly how I could prove it was mine, including the ID. In the most condescending tone possible, they tell me there's nothing they can do. I have to wait for closing, three hours later, and a manager to get it back, long after the last SkyTrain. Fancy talk for Subway. Leaves and forces me into a $65 plus cab home. I ask if they can just call a manager over. I understand they can't just give out coats without tickets all willy-nilly, but with a manager called over, really taking the minimum amount of effort possible, the whole thing could have been over within 30 seconds. Nope, they clearly didn't give half an SH about me having my jacket. Well, SH, there's no way I'm leaving without it and having it disappear when I go to get it the next day. I have to deal with this tonight. Easier said than done. After again explaining how easily this whole situation could be resolved, they decided to make their power play. Their power play turned out to be saying word for word, we're going to ignore you now. Now, I'm not a competitive man, I'm not a vengeful man, but I am a patient man. A very patient man. In this case, a man with unlimited patience. So I said, I'm going to ignore you too. But that's not all that I did. The petty revenge you want? Sure thing. If you're going to be waiting around for a very long time, like say for bar closing, you have to have something to lean against. In this case, I chose the empty pitcher that served as a tip jar for the two coat check attendants. Immediately, I saw a splash of panic in one of their eyes, but out of their principle, not a word of protest. As long as they were refusing to rectify my easily fixable situation, I refused to let them take in a single cent a tip, leaning over the pitcher in their plain sight with a smile on my face. Nothing. Even when they tried to get clever and set out a second one at the far side of the counter, a quick, oh sorry, excuse me, gotta grab this, cut through the line of drunks collecting their coats and provided me with some perfect additional arm support. I was going nowhere, but they were getting nothing. Someone had to break and it sure wasn't gonna be me. I just wanted my effing jacket, d it. So for the next hour and a half, the last sky train was long since gone, I stood and watched with glee as the two attendants worked nonstop, taking in and giving out everyone's jackets without taking in a cent of tip money because of me. They had damaged me in one go, and a devastating one at that. But I got the satisfaction of watching them slowly realize the error of their stubbornness over a long, long time, their faces turning from stony half-smiles to the bitterest of longings for what those two pitchers could have meant to them. Lo and behold, a bit before closing, my coat check ticket was turned in, and I got to leave with my jacket before the manager got involved. I got everything I needed while they left with nothing. Success. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications.